Let's get started. This is my name is Gary Matsoka, and we're here at this morning at Laguna Hills Nursery in Santa Ana. And today's topic is going to be edible leaves of trees and shrubs. Um, a few years ago, most of the literature was just stating that there's just a few, but as you look into it, there's quite a few more things that you can eat uh, that are permanent parts of the garden, or semi-permanent parts that uh, that we've are used to. So the last few years, the big name on the map has been the moringa tree. And uh, this tree, let me write it down. Became real popular in India. I'm not sure if it's native there. I think it's actually African originally. originally. And there's quite a few species. <clears throat> and we eat the leaves of quite a few of them. This one's uh, the one that starts with an O, Moringa Olarif, or, or something like that. <clears throat> but we do have other ones around. The they are kind of subtropical, tropical um, young plants. You can lose them in the winter. The older trees, once they're in the ground and have a year behind them, they seem to be pretty resistant to cold in this area. They can drop their leaves in the winter. Um, Fast growing tree. So, this one, uh, it's the leaves, well, actually, most of the plants edible. So, the flower buds, the leaves, the pods they make. Uh, our tree's not making pods yet, but the pods of moringa tend to be quite long, about so thick, even longer. Sometimes they're two foot long. Um, they've got edible seeds inside of them. And the pot itself is quite edible on young trees. The, as they get older and the pods get a little tougher, they're still quite good to eat. You just have to know how to eat them. So um, the, in the third world countries, edible leaves are really important because they have a high protein content versus fruit. Fruit doesn't have as much protein in it, but the leaves do. So, um, in fact, a lot of the uh, uh, edible leaves around the world are like 10% protein fresh and almost half protein once they're dried. So quite high in protein. Not important for our country. You can eat, uh, you get a lot of protein to eat here. But in third world countries, it's real important. Uh, Moringa is also considered fairly drought tolerant when established. So... Uh, but quick growing, 20 to 30 foot. Uh, in most countries, what we do with them here is every winter cut them down to maybe three to six feet tall so that when they grow back, the leaves and the flowers and the pods are within picking height. So try to, you know, try to keep them cut. Otherwise, everything gets pretty high. You have to climb a ladder to pick it. In a lot of tropical areas, they actually plant new seeds and new plants every year. It's so fast. Here, uh, we're not tropical enough to get a good crop every year, so it's advisable to uh, leave the tree in. In fact, this year, the spring was so cool, we couldn't get the seeds going. So our crop is lagging behind. It finally got warm enough about a month ago, a uh, month, month and a half ago, to get the seeds to sprout. And uh, we'll have some plants available probably within a few weeks. We brought some in from some growers. Uh, but you can see the yellow leaves on here. They're not super happy in the grower soil. So most of our growers use some kind of wood compost as part of the mix. And if you keep it too wet, they turn yellow and rot. So if you were to get some of these, um, I would tell you, knock off about half the dirt when you plant them. So that uh, there's not so much compost around the root. Uh, when we grow them, no compost around them. You can water them as much as you like. They're fine. You need a big pot. They grow fast. I mean, at least 15 gallon. Um, first year, they, you know, from this size, within the next six months, they can reach eight foot, six to eight foot. Um, 
So they're, they're fast growing trees. Now in the tropics, they also sometimes harvest the entire tree the first year. They use the roots for something um, as a condiment, something like horseradish. Uh, the foliage is kind of like spinach, a little bit on the tart side. So, but certainly a good addition to things like salads and tacos. And, and any stage of growth you can improve? Yeah, the newer leaves are a little bit better, but this is fairly fresh growth here. But yeah, any, any of the leaves are fine. Not going to touch any of that stuff. <laughs> I'm sure there are. I mean, in the third world countries, of course, this is for people who are suffering from lack of protein. This is like medicine. But here, it's uh, it's just a nice addition to your salads or your tacos or whatever you want to put greens in that's more nutritious than say lettuce. So. Pardon. When they're young, but they get big pretty fast. I don't think the slugs can reach them. The question was, do they attract slugs? And I don't know. We haven't had trouble with that. So as when the pods are, are coming down, when the pods are decent size, you can pick them. What we usually do on our mature tree is slice them in little pieces and then slice them lengthwise too and put them in stew or soup. And then the most, it's just the outer skin of the pot is pretty tough. And you can scrape off the meat on the inside with the teeth like when you eat artichokes. I mean, the artichoke. And it does have a very nice asparagus flavor. Okay. So very, I, I like the pods better than the leaves when you, when you steam them. And when the trees are very young, they'll still make pods the first year. Those pods, the entire pot is edible. But as they get older, the outer skin gets a bit tough. So that's Moringa. Now a new plant that's kind of similar is, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, Katuk. Um, the botanical name Seropus androgynous. And this is from the wet tropics of Asia. So southern Asia, they said over to Australia. Um, but this is a lowland tropical wet climate bush that grows so oh, three to four foot tall around here. They said it might get up to six or seven foot under ideal conditions. We don't have ideal conditions. Uh, they said uh, the main thing with this one versus Moringa, which is more drought tolerant, this one needs a lot. Of stay, it's got to stay wet. Um, full sun is fine. Part sun is fine. We don't know how they'll look respond to our winters here. So in Florida, they can disappear totally, burn down uh, in the winter and come back up from a stump. We don't know what's going to happen here. Uh, first year we've had it. It the leaves on this one in some areas is called the sweet leaf. To me, it's kind of in between moringa and stevia. It's actually got a more. They said in the in southern Asia, this gets a lot more use than moringa does because it just tastes a bit milder. But yeah, very little pungency to it. Would the moringa plant um, have full sun as well, or is it okay? Moringa is best in full sun. I mean, they'll grow um, trees and shrubs will grow anywhere, but they're you know the moringa needs the heat, uh, so you want to get that and more sun to get going. Um, but this one, yeah, the uh, flavor you can say it's sweeter, slightly nutty. So they said it gets a lot more use than a uh, moringa tree in, in the wet, wetter tropics anyway. In the drier climates, the moringa does better. But this one is, is kind of new. We haven't, we, my daughter knows this stuff. I, this is the first time I've heard of it. We brought in quite a few plants. So that's the uh, katook. Um, 
Another one from Eastern Asia, Tunis sinensis. which is this plant here. So this is related to a weed tree that grows uh, in the U.S. I think it's from Europe called uh, Zel... Oh, I forgot what it was called. Anyway, this is not the weed tree, but it acts like one. So uh, Tuna sinensis, if you grow it, uh, it can grow... They say it can grow 80 foot. Uh, generally, you see it around 20 to 30 feet. It does root sucker. So if you once you plant one, you get new trees coming up all around it. Uh, in China, in that part of Asia, um, the, the new growth is used as a vegetable. And it's real unique, uh, uh, especially in spring. So this is a deciduous tree. And in spring, when it first wakes up, the new growth is quite red. In some plants, pink. And they claim that the pinker or redder the foliage is, the better the flavor. But even this tree, if you just pick off some of the new foliage, uh, it's got a very unusual flavor. Um, you can certainly get the onion in there. So onion, uh, floral, kind of florally, kind of a bouillon thing. Almost, you know, almost like a meaty dish or something, but, but definitely uh, some onion in that. So they say they, they have uh, entire cuisines based on this tree. So what they do with it, they don't let it grow high. Every, every so often they just chop it down, let it regrow, chop it down, use the foliage up, let it regrow. The new growth is the best part to eat. Is that plant just for the leaves, or can you use other parts of the plant? Don't know. I didn't do enough research. The katook, same thing, they trim them down constantly, trim them down to uh, about a foot or so, let them regrow. They said they send a lot of the new stalks of fresh new leaves to Japan and to other parts of Asia. They sell it as a leafy asparagus. They said it's got uh, similar qualities. So. So one of the other families of plants, the hibiscus family, are Malvaceae. Mallows are, as we know, hibiscus. So that family is fairly edible. The hibiscus family, which is found around the world, North America, Europe, Asia, Africa, is quite edible. Um, one of the more famous ones is the roselle, which is hibiscus. Sabdorifa, Sabdorifa. Now this one, at least here, is an annual because it dies in the winter and in tropical areas it can live over the winter but here it's definitely an annual and generally the first year now this year they're off to a late start again because we had a cool spring that's one of the disadvantages of Orange County is that our spring is relatively cool compared to say Florida where it's 90 degrees by April so they're a little behind but generally they'll grow six to seven foot during the year just the leaves. Now the leaves are edible too. So all, most hibiscus, the foliage is edible, especially the younger leaves. Um, but what they do is they'll grow until the nights start getting longer. And as soon as we get to fall, they start making their flowers. The flowers on these are kind of a, I forget what color they are. I believe they're kind of a creamy yellow with a red center. And then uh, after they finish blooming, they make these really fleshy pods that are red and have a nice cranberry, tart cranberry flavor. So they use it to make hibiscus tea out of. 
Um, Is that the one they call Jamaica tea? Probably. Probably. It's grown all over the world, but it's uh, originally from Africa, I believe. Yeah, it's West African. So uses an annual save the seed pods, at least one or two seed pods in the fall to start new plants for the next year. But uh, very fast growing, and they make their seed pods in the fall. So. And the foliage also has a kind of a cranberry, kind of a tart flavor to it. Close related to this one, and I don't have any of these for sale right now, this is a hibiscus acetosella, which is a red hibiscus or cranberry hibiscus. This is used here mostly as an ornamental. But um, in Africa, now they claim this isn't a naturally occurring plant. It was some kind of hybrid that was found in West Africa, and the natives there, people from there, would cook the young foliage and use it for food. Uh, so when the slaves were brought over to the North American, and, well, to the Americas, this came with them. So very popular, and they said it's real popular now in Brazil as a uh, uh, vegetable, the new growth on this one. This one makes red flower hibiscus. They bloom uh, shorts when the, when the days are also short, so in the fall and spring you get brilliant red flowers. On a plant like this, you hardly even notice them because the uh, color of the leaves is close. A little bit brighter red than the, than the foliage. I've had a hard time keeping those alive. Don't know why. We, we don't seem to have any trouble with it. We have water twice a week. Mm -hmm. but, and I never saw any, anything. But I love the color. Yeah, so for us, this one has been easy. The winters so far have not killed them. I'm sure we'll get a frost now and then that can kill them. Uh, there is a variegated leaf version, hate ashberry, that uh, is really, really popular. We're, we're growing that one. This one uh, will grow a little bit of the straight red ones too. But um, quite a nice ornamental plant. Figure about five to seven foot height so most of the hibiscus plants grow about the same height that family uh, evergreen and again blooms in the when the days are shorter full sun full sun <laughs> so that was hibiscus said Ocella. Now, the literature claims that the other popular hibiscus are also edible. I'm not going to try these. But they said the new foliage on the, quote, rose, uh, hibiscus rosa sinensis, the popular ornamental, which is from China, the leaves are popularly used in China as, as a vegetable. We know that gorillas love the flowers. So, and then even the hibiscus from more Western Asia and the Mediterranean area, the Rose of Sharon, hibiscus uh, syriac is supposed to be edible too. It's interesting that there are no, there are not that many pests on these plants. We, you figure if they're edible, why doesn't everything in the world eat the foliage? But we know snails eat a little bit of it, but still, um, other than white fly, there's not that many pests on hibiscus. So I haven't figured out if the uh, abutilons, the flowering maples, which are in the same family, if, if, if they're edible at all. There's quite a few members of that family. So. Now, one plant we used to sell a lot of that we're not allowed to anymore is the um, all right. 
forgot the name of this already. <laughs> this is the Indian um, spice. An, someone give me the name. Thank you. <laughs> this left my mind. Curry plant, Koanigi. So we used to sell hundreds of these every year. Uh, they can be difficult in, quote, the wrong kind of soil. They're really easy to grow in pure sand or our potting soil. Uh, our potting soil being the... The top pot, which doesn't have ground up trees in it. That's the whole problem with a lot of these plants is they don't like the ground up trees that are found in, in most potting soils. But curry plants, the Indian people told me that they would fry these leaves in oil uh, to impart and then use the oil to impart flavor and then then crinkle up the fried leaves and, and sprinkle them on their food also. So that uh, curry is in the same family as citrus. And one of the problems we're having with it is because it is a citrus relative, it can carry the same diseases that are causing trouble with citrus. And since there is no certified clean uh, source of curry leaves, they don't want us, the EP, well, the egg department does not want nurseries to sell it. Um, now you can, you know, if you want to get curry plants, there are trees in the area that have seeds. You just go up to those trees, take the seeds, plant them immediately. They don't last very long. Um, and uh, grow your own curry plant. And I can tell you where to find a tree that's accessible to the public after the class. But uh, uh, so there, are, you can you can grow them. We cannot sell them. From seed, most plants from seed are disease free. Not always. Uh, so there's a question there too. But uh, uh, I would expect that it's fine. So that's curry. Now this one, uh, we sell a little bit of it. So from the lowland areas of the tropics, Asian tropics, this is Pandanus amaryllifolius. Um, that one's not for sale. This is actually related to things like yucca, I believe. Uh, Dracaenas, yuccas, same kind of the same family, but the leaves apparently are used to uh, flavor the food. Um, and I think people eat the foliage too. This is These uh, generally grow, and one of the common names for them is screw pine. They make these cones. They also, uh, the foliage kind of goes in a spiral pattern up the tree. So... And as far as we know, this one has trouble with uh, winters here. So you'd have to keep it in an atrium, bring it inside for the winter. Uh, and it's generally grown outside in semi-sun. What we do with these is take some of the side shoots off and, and root them and get them going. But uh, right now we don't have any plants for sale on that. I'll mention this one because we have it in stock. So this is uh, a plant from the American tropics. It's one of the ones we call elephant here. And they just call it University of Massachusetts. Because Massachusetts has been working on it. They want to develop a crop that they can grow there in the short season they have. So in Brazil and in most of tropical America, you cannot grow spinach or lettuce or a lot of the our popular leafy vegetables because it's too hot. They don't have a chance there. So this plant is what they grow and use instead of spinach. Um, now, what we understood is that this entire family, this is the philodendron family, or the Aracy family, 
is that all of them have a, uh, a toxin in them. Of course, uh, spinach has exactly the same one, so it's not that big a deal. So they all have oxalacetic acid, which in apparently in huge doses might cause trouble with your breathing and with your swallowing. It's an irritant that gets in the mouth, but it's what makes spinach taste sharp. Uh, so a lot of the sharp flavor things, pineapple, uh, oxalacetic acid. So this one does too. Um, so it, it likes it moist. It'll take full sun, full shade. Um, anyway, um, Xanthosoma, University of Massachusetts. So they're, they're trying to develop a new crop for their their uh, farmers who grow under uh, those little um, Quonset hut plastic huts. So the, the toxin in it, I can only assume that it would be really such a high amount of consume, consumption that it would be. Like, I don't think anyone would eat that much to be. True. Okay. But a lot of the indoor plants, uh, philodendrons, uh, especially and Diffenbachia's, Diffenbachia's dumb cane, because if you eat too much of it, you can't talk. It, it numbs the mouth, but uh, I think they overplayed the toxicity of it because there's a lot of things we eat that have it in there, so they shouldn't call it, say, a poison. <laughs> so. Does it get cooked out, or does it stay there regardless? Don't know. That I don't know. Is that why uh, animals are toxic? Well, that's why they're allegedly toxic to animals, because the, the cats at my house eat all the philodendrons, all the plants you're not supposed to eat, they've eaten them. <laughs> Apparently they're not deadly. So, I mean, we've heard problems with a lot of the other plants too. So they said uh, this was, this um, katook was um, promoted as a weight loss thing. So people started eating massive quantities of it. <laughs> and they've had some health issues. I mean, it's like, you know, if it helps for weight loss, you're not supposed to eat that much of it. But uh, they said the people that started eating mass quantities of this and had health problems. Um, I've even heard the same thing from Moringa. If you eat way too much, um, something happens. But, oh, you know, I forgot one of the hibiscus family plants sitting back here. So this is related to okra. The slugs love it. Yeah. So this is uh, Abelmosius manihot. From um, Southern Asia through um, all the way to, I believe it's to Australia. So it's real popular in the South Pacific. My daughter went to Fiji last last fall and said, boy, these are all over the place. And the people just pick there and eat the leaves like lettuce. And they, they get bigger than this. This is a plant that's in this little tiny pot for a year, so it needs to be in a bigger pot. But the leaves, you eat them, they're about the same as lettuce. Or a little slightly thicker and maybe a hair tougher. But the flavor-wise, they're, they're real close. Uh, they said they use them a lot for wrapping food and just eat the whole thing. So instead of a taco shell, use one of these. But and this and there's quite a few different shapes of leaves and colors. So the original plant had a leaf that was a little more three-lobed, thinner, hibiscus-like, cream-colored flowers. This one has a same similar large hibiscus-like flower with a uh, dark center and variegated portions of it. So instead of just being cream, it's cream splashed with a lot of pink. Um, now these here so far have, I can, we read about uh, the Panhandle in Florida, these would just freeze to the dirt and come back out of the ground every year and get to about six or seven feet. Here apparently they don't freeze to the ground, they keep their trunk um, and they'll grow about six or seven foot. Somewhat. I mean, you know, the best way to keep slugs off is to put some copper around the trunk. We have the copper tape, but uh, to keep slugs off. But yeah, the slugs in the winter time uh, or late winter, early spring, 
just riddle the leaves. It's it's real tasty, I guess. What's the common name of that one again? Manny Hot. Oh well, that's not it. Um, this particular one, this cultivar, because this is a chosen cultivar, is con called Aunt Lil's Salad Tree. So I guess salad tree is one thing they use commonly too. Okay, well, if you're from Persia, one of the favorite foods is also grape leaves. The uh, European grape. So the American grape and hybrids, which have leaves that are felty, they don't like those. Just the Europe, straight European. Now, we don't sell European grapes here. We get too much mildew on them, but they'll grow. You might not get any good grapes here. But if you want to use it for food, this is the one that they they use. And I kind of remember when I was a kid, they wrapped Japanese confection with grape leaves too, and you eat the leaves. Now some of the other uh, leaves that are harvested and used are mulberries and figs, but. It's okay, I, I'm not going to try those. <laughs> but apparently mulberry trees and fig trees, which are related to each other, they'll pick the new growth off and also use them in, in dishes. So. Are any of these plants uh, low on the nutritional scales, but just plain edible? Or do they, just, I guess, range in nutritional? Well, protein-wise, uh, they're all pretty high just because leaves are made out of protein uh, so you know the fruit may not have as much protein in it but the foliage of a plant the living functioning part of the plant is quite high in protein so most leaves have a lot of protein I don't know that lettuce does or cabbage but tree leaves apparently most of them have a lot of protein in them uh, so yeah yeah, good. Yeah, good if you're a vegetarian. So, um, but you know, again, you know, you, your body may react to them initially. So be careful when you start eating plants, <laughs> unusual plants. What would you yes. be your pick if you were going to of all these plants? What would be your pick to go home with today? Well, uh, of the ones, the question was which one would be our favorite. I would have to say the most that I've tasted and liked has been this uh, Katuk. Uh, seems to be quite good. And uh, in the literature, a lot of people like this. They said one gentleman in Florida had this and the Moringa trees. He says, he just eats this now. Much, much better tasting than Moringa, he said. So um, we just don't know how easy this is to grow through the winter yet. So far this year, we've got these in in spring. Uh, actually, it was early summer and been growing, and growing them, and they seem to be doing just fine with our with our weather right now. But when it gets cold, we don't know how it's going to react. Full sun. Full sun to full shade. But this one was the one. The most important thing was wet. They said the area where it's native to 120 inches of rain a year. So. Uh, keep that soil pretty wet. Mm -hmm. Again, this was the Katuk. Now, as far as, uh, you know, so we talk about the soil. Um, when you come across bugs on plants like this, we don't like to use too many nasty things because you're eating the foliage. So some of the more important things to use would be things like Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew, which contains spinosad. Spinosad is a part, apparently a part of rum. This will control chewing insects, not slugs or snails, but most chewing insects this will control. And then the oil products for sucking bugs, 
So Dr. Earth has a line of um, essential oils, rosemary oil, sesame oil, peppermint oil, thyme, cinnamon, garlic, uh, glycerin, lecithin, which are wetting agents or soaps, all together in one product. That's pretty neat that they can put food grade materials together. And this one also, pure crop one, which is quite expensive, but soybean oil, corn oil, uh, carrot, onion, orange, soap, vanilla, so all food grade materials. The EPA doesn't have any number on this at all. They said this is not considered, well, it's, you can eat this stuff. So they just, they just say, okay, no problem. Um, but the nursery industry is interested in the essential oil products because they are food grade and if they mix a lot of them together they don't know how if the bugs can become immune to that many different things at one time so interested in these for the industry we do have neem oil also but neem oil does have kind of a nasty odor to it so I'm not sure what what uh, what taste that would impart on the plants kind of a sulfur like no, it might be onion like Okay, any questions today? And are you yes. saying to rotate some of the pest returns? So just in case they might get used to it? Yeah, that's always a good practice. So the question was, uh, well, uh, we like to rotate pesticides around because uh, when any particular pesticide out there, they always talk about it killing, uh, you know, the best pesticides kill about 90, 95% of the pests that they're intended to which means there's always a few left that are immune to that pesticide. So if you keep using the same one, then you only got that one pest left and it just multiplies like crazy and takes over again. But if you rotate your pesticides around, usually the one that's immune to one product isn't immune to the next one you use. So it's, yeah, it's good to keep using something different if you can. I mean, as well as you can. So. I didn't study marigolds. I mean, they marigolds, um, they do feed the flower petals to chickens to make the egg yolks darker. Uh, so I'd imagine they're edible. Um, marigolds are related to Mexican tarragon, which is used for a spice, so probably. Well, the plant stevia, we haven't seen much bug activity on that on our plants here. I'm sure the general caterpillars will eat them, but yeah, I haven't seen that much. Yeah, stevia is interesting. It's certainly a sweetener, so uh, it's definitely a weed. It looks like it looks just like a weed in your garden. Uh, it grows about this tall, straight up. And in the fall, you harvest, you just cut it off and dry the leaves, and they all taste like sugar. So. Does it get pretty, pretty wide, or it's kind of steady? No. Stevia, about this tall, about this wide. Upright stems, multi, you know, they get some branching, not much. And then uh, it can live several years, but stevia, the first year it makes good foliage, the second year it just makes a lot of flowers. So most people start cuttings or start new plants every year on stevia. So you get more leaves instead of flowers. Are there flowers there? Don't know. Have not tried them. Okay. I think that's it for today. Thank you.